Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Alessis RA500 amplifier. There are two other units within the range. There's an RA150 and also an RA300 but this is the largest in the series. So in terms of build quality, um, extremely well built. You know, there's, there's really no compromise uh, with regard to the amp. So, you know, steel construction, the only sort of plastic that you see on the amplifier is just the front fascia which is easily removed. Um, and then in terms of technical specifications here, you can see that the power output RMS is 2 times 250 watts into 4 ohm speakers. And this reduces down to RMS of 150 watts uh, times 2 into an 8 ohm load. But from the rear you can make the selection between stereo and then also select then bridge mode. So you just have the single output then and that will deliver 500 watts into 8 ohms. And then in terms of signal to noise ratio, then it's greater than 105 dB. And then frequency response is 10 Hz to 70 kHz. That's really good. And then harmonic distortion is looking at 0.02% uh, of 4 ohms. And then that's a frequency range of 20 Hz to 20 kHz. Now on the rear of the amplifier, you have an input voltage selection. So again, for worldwide usage, you can select you know, operating voltage 120 volts or 230 volts. And then in terms of format, it comes in at a 3U format. These other amplifiers, they would normally be a 2U or 19 inch rack mount. And then dimensions wise, it's 143 millimeters high by a width of 480. And then the depth comes in at 272. And this amplifier is very heavy. And you'll see this later on in the video when you see the large EI transformer. But unboxed, it's coming in at 13 kilograms. So just a little bit of word of caution. If you've got this thing on the bench, you know, just make sure you're sort of gripping it with two hands as you're moving it around. Because, uh, you know, I wouldn't want that to fall off the bench in there and land on your toe. And then for the inputs, you have a balanced quarter inch jack. And there's also unbalanced. And I'll put a link for the repair description because I've already covered previously uh, the difference between balanced and unbalanced type inputs. But on the 500 version, you also have XLR speaker connections as well, and including like the terminal post, which can also accept a four millimeter banana jack. Um, you don't have the XLR connections on the 300 or the 150 series. All right, so let's sort of kind of just take an overview as regard to the amplifier and what the sort of the issue was when it came in. Well, um, when you look from the front here and what I'm showing you is you can see that the amplifier is extremely dusty and this is normal because the top grill on the amplifier uh, you know has multiple slots in there covering the whole amp so it's not unusual of course over time that dust and dirt falls through and then will coat the circuit boards. As with all these amplifiers when they come into the workshop the first thing really you need to be doing is just to give it a clean you know you've got to get that dust and dirt out of there and that could be a combination like a stiff brush, long hair brush, or maybe a compressed airline. But yeah, just clear it out. And then the next thing that I'm showing you as well is just on the left hand side, you can see here that this is the power output module. And then you also have the driver board as well, which solders into there. And then now what I'm showing you is the right hand board. Now, from a servicing point of view, it's very easy to disconnect them. So again, when I sort of talk about the testing phase, I'll sort of come back to that and how you would do, you know, a functional test. But yeah, dead easy, you know, and if you want to work on the modules separate to the main amp, again, very easy to remove them and then just, you know, put the chassis and the power transformer, etc., just to one side. And, you know, it does make servicing very, very easy to do. And then the next thing here is the rear of the amplifier. And it's sort of interesting that you have this uh, power protection fuse and if you're running at 230 volts then you can see that it's rated at a time delay and that's 5 amps and then if you're going to flick it over then to you know 120 volt operation then that will increase up to 10 amps so just make sure you fit the appropriate fuse if you need to change it and I have said on previous um, tutorials it's probably not uncommon sometimes that you can find this fuse blackened indicating excess current draw and that's normally due to uh, one of the small uh, high frequency filtering capacitors, which is mounted across the bridge rectifier, but um, not in this case. So really, what was the issue here? Well, the first thing that I want to sort of show you is you can see that the large uh, power transformer 
and uh, this is an EI type so when you power up the amplifier without say the bulb current limiter you hear the momentary sort of buzz uh, but it does run quiet you know and this amplifier doesn't have any kind of fan cooling at all it's really silent it's tended to be used like, for studio use but what I would say you know when you're sort of 500 watts you're sort of normally outside the range of that um, but you know being fanless you know it, it does run quiet you know it's it's, it's good and then the next thing I want to sort of share with you is the top of the power supply board. And then what you can see on this board is a brown glue. And this is probably the first time I've seen it on the RA500. Now, this is a very, very common thing that you see in all amplifiers of a particular era. And what the manufacturer's thinking behind it was that if they put this brown glue in place, then it would provide additional mechanical support for large components like the smoothing capacitors. Um, but really, the, you know, these smoothing capacitors are very small, you know, they don't, they don't need this additional glue. But the problem with the glue is that over time the glue will dry out and it gives you two issues. First of all, it becomes conductive, not 100%, but enough that leads or components which should not be connected together start to conduct. And that's going to cause you issues. And then the other one is if it's covering components, unlike these capacitors where maybe there's a plastic coating, if it's covering maybe a resistor or maybe a ceramic disc capacitor, what you'll find is that it starts to corrode through the component. So what I've done here is I've just took the time to remove the power supply board and that's easy enough to do. Uh, you just have four fixing screws and then you'll also have another screw which then goes through the bridge rectifier and once you disconnect it, it's quite easy to, to work on it separately on the bench. There is quite a lot of glue here, so I've, what I've had to do is desolder a number of components and just get in there. There is still elasticity to this glue, so it hadn't fully dried out, but what I'm doing here is just preventing any future issues for the customer. And then the next thing I'm sort of looking at is what was the issue with the amp? Well, the amplifier, when you first powered it up, you would see the blue LED on the front. But after, say, four or five seconds, you would not hear the speaker protection relay change over. And I've covered this in previous tutorials for the Alessis RA150, and I'll put the link in the description. But the most common issue is due to the speaker protection relay goes open circuit or the relay coil goes very, very high in resistance. And again, for this amplifier, that was the fault. Now, the way in which you can sort of test it um, the, before you remove the board, what you want to do is just verify that it's not, or the protection circuit is not being triggered, for example, by maybe an issue from the left or right channel power modules. So just unplug them from the board, both the power, and then you also have a multi-pin connector, which is like your sensing uh, connections. And then if you power up the amplifier again, if the relay change is over, then you know you have an issue with either of those power output modules, but you just need to connect one of them and verify which one was triggering. And it's what it's looking for is high DC. Once I disconnected them, powered it up, the relay still didn't change over. So that told me there was a high probability of the relay issue. Now, because this amplifier is more powerful than the, early, or the smaller versions in the range, they do actually fit the same relay. So it's like a 10 amp rated switching relay, 12 volts coil. Um, but what I've done here is I haven't used like a, a typical 5 amp relay. What I'm showing next is I will I'll show you a Chirac relay. And I've used these, you know, for literally decades. And Chirac, um, and I think it's actually been bought out by another company, produce excellent relays. Often they're used in industrial applications. And the switching current for this relay is 8 amps. And it's, you know, gold-plated contact switching. So that means once the relay was in, into the board, you know, this customer, you know, is going to have no issues at all, you know, with, with sort of worn contacts, which could lead to distortion or intermittent loss of sound. And for sure, you know, I've never seen a Chirac relay in all the years I've been using them where the relay coil, you know, will go high in resistance or open circuit. And you can see that I'm showing you this here. So what I've done is I've just connected it to the multimeter just with a couple of clip on clips, hook clips. And you can see that the resistance of the coil is in the order of mega ohms so it's gone very very high in resistance not open circuit but still very very high and uh, just simply replacing the relay you know fixes the issue 
If you're going to go do a stage or power up on the amp after, what I would always advise you to do is, of course, power it up via a dim bulb tester and then connect the left channel first or the right channel, either one, and then power it up via the dim bulb. And just with one of the power output modules connected, it should still uh, have enough current passing through. The bulb was more light, slight, but not too high. And you should hear the speaker protection relay change over. Disconnect that channel and then reconnect the other one and then do the same again. And if you hear the change over, then to be honest, you're pretty good. And you should be able to connect both power output modules and then power up them without the series current bulb limiter. So the next thing I, I want to sort of focus on here, and I'm just showing you just an extract from the service manual, just for clarification before we sort of move on to another issue. So what I'm showing here is the circuit diagram or the schematic. And for this amplifier, it's really the same circuit board that you have on all of the series. The only thing which is different, and I'll come back to that in a moment, is of course the bridge rectifier, because the bridge rectifier needs to be a higher current rating than the smaller amplifiers. And what you have here is the dedicated IC, which is used for the measurement of any DC offset. And then in turn, that would then be used to uh, switch through for the speaker protection relay. And as I've highlighted here, I'm showing that it just went high in resistance. Now, the other issue, and this amplifier really hadn't had a lot of usage before this relay coil failed. And you might say, well, how, how do you know this? Well, on amplifiers like this, if they've been used extensively, what you'll find is that the power components for example, the large drop-in resistors, which are quite near to where I'm signalling where there was a capacitor which had gone uh, high ESR. These resistors go, um, well, they actually discolour, and then often you'll find that they will give off an odour when they're heated up. For this amplifier, there was no indication of that at all. So a bit of a shame, really, because the owner probably, you know, saw this thing fail, and maybe it had been in storage, you know, ever since. So there is no reason to replace those resistors. But what I would also draw your attention to are the smoothing capacitors within the power supply. And this is both the low voltage power supply plus or minus 15 volts. And then you also have the 12 volt power supply, which is where this, uh, this capacitor had gone high in value. Now, the reason why it's gone high in value is that the capacitors are often mounted very, very close to power, sorry, power resistors or some of the series regulation transistors. So they're like mini radiators and with a top cover on, they generate quite a bit of heat. And then that heat then will dry out the electrolyte inside of the electrolytic capacitors and cause them to fail. So what I do is I just remove the electrolytics in the small power supplies here. And I just verify them with an ESR meter. And as I said, you know, it was quite easy then to confirm here that C407, which is rated at uh, 47 microfarads, and I think it's 25 volt rating for this capacitor. Yeah, 25 volts. And uh, really, you know, just too high. So it wasn't actually doing the job that it was designed to do. So uh, just simply replacing that. And then the next thing that I'm showing you is the underneath of the board. And the reason for that is often you will find multiple dry solder joints. So it's very, very important to focus on where the power components are and just reflow those solder connections often you know don't just repair a specific fault just do some additional work just to ensure that you know you're not going to have any issues you know later on once once you know the repair is complete so if we kind of move on now the next thing that i'm showing you is the front of the amplifier and and this again is is not uncommon right you you do see this fault from time to time or issue rather than a fault um the plastic bezel is connected uh, via uh, two, sorry, four Allen screws, left and right to either side. And then what happens is that the front fascia, you've got clips on the top and then the bottom of the chassis. So if you just press them lightly, you'll just be able to unclip the front fascia, which also comes away with the two volume control potentiometers. And um, what you'll do is you have a multi-core cable with a plug on which connects to the power supply board. So once you've disconnected that, you then need to remove the left and right channel um, connection leads from the power output modules, well, they're actually on the driver boards, and then you can remove the fascia and then put the main chassis to one side. 
Now, what has happened here is that the um, filter bezel or the filter screen where the LED indicator is for the signal inputs had just come away. And it's a bit of a bad design, really. So what they've done during manufacture is they just have you know a series of holes left and right. And then it sits on these two pins, plastic pins, and they just use maybe a hot soldering iron just to melt the pins down to hold it in place. And then they actually melt part of the bezel from the rear just to sort of anchor the screen in position, which is a bit naff. So no wonder they sort of pop out. So what I'm now showing you is the bezel sort of repaired. So I just clean that off and make sure that the filter can sit very, very flush, you know, just make sure that there's no sort of residual plastic. And then what I'll do is I'll just use a two-part epoxy resin. So in this type, in this case, it's Araldite Rapids, which sort of sets in about five minutes. And just be a little bit careful because when you mix this stuff, you know, if it's quite warm in your workshop, you know, it can kind of sort of trail across the screen or the filter. So, you know, just be very careful. And then you may be able to just apply some left, right and then top and bottom, you know, sort of give it 10 or 15 minutes. And when you come back, you know, it'll be you know better than new then. And then the other thing that I'm showing is the volume control potentiometers. Now, sometimes they do become loose. But the good thing here is you can remove the volume control knob, so don't try and pry them off from the front. You can see the hole, or there is a hole, so you can just push them off from the rear and then just use, you know, the appropriate uh, spanner just to, you know, tighten them back up again. What I would advise as well, tend to or, or avoid using something like, you know, a pair of pliers, because it's very easy, you know, for pliers to slip and maybe uh, damage the shaft of the potentiometers. And then while it was off, off the or removed from the amp. The thing here is I was just spraying in um, high quality switch cleaner. So this is deoxid and then just rotating those potentiometers backwards and forwards. Just make sure they're nice and clean then. And then I'm also showing you as well the LED board. So you can see that this is the indicator, which will be the signal strength coming in. And then also as well, you know, the top blue LED. Uh, and dead easy to remove from the plastic bezel. Um, if you do kind of find this filter, you know, sort of pushed in, you know, don't try and sort of work from it from the rear or try and repair it, you know, without removing it. You know, it's like, it's going to take you next to no time, you know, probably four or five minutes just to remove the bezel and then dead easy then to work on it rather than you sort of struggling, you know, from the back. But just be careful when you refit, you know, like these plastic clips that clip top and bottom and probably not the most robust thing you've seen and over time you know such plastics do become brittle so just be careful because you don't want to sort of snap any of them off then and then in terms of adjustment you know there was no sort of adjustment to be made here because the bias was already set on the two modules um, because I was only replacing the speaker protection relay it was just a case of just verifying the DC offset on the back of the amplifier and for both channels, you know, they were coming in about 2 and about 1.98 millivolts, so very, very low. And then, uh, of course, carried out, you know, a complete functional test. And as you can see here, I'm just showing you the famous uh, relay, which always fails. And then also the, uh, the capacitor, which was removed then from the, the low voltage power supply. So there you have it. So that's sort of the uh, overview repair description, you know, sort of complete now. So as always, I appreciate you stopping by. And if you have any questions or you need any information, by all means, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com. I'll be quite happy to uh, come back to you, give you any other guidance or support that you may require. All right. So I wish you all the very best until the next time. Cheers. Bye bye.